there are real problems in the world. There's no doubt about it. But it's the way in which you get to choose to respond to those instead of being so constricted by fear and playing it so safe. Because to me, that's scarier than death. So I, I have to live in a way that is more alive, even if it means risking it, even in my animal brain, if that means, oh, but that's dangerous, don't do it. You'll be kicked from the tribe. You'll be left alone and starved to death and you will die. I have to find something that's not the mind, something that is more courageous. And the Stoics talked about it a lot, really listening to the wise self, not the wounded self, like listen to the heart, not the head, and pursue that path instead, because I think that fear is the compass. And if you can follow it, the, the, the treasure is yours for the taking. Hello, and welcome back to the Hannah Frankman podcast. I'm your host. And on today's episode, I'm speaking with Stee Lane. Stee is a health coach and the host of the Radical Health Radio podcast. And I met Stee a couple of months ago when he reached out to me about having me on his podcast to talk about the intersection between alternative education and alternative health, because these two things are much more connected than we think they are, people's ability to make healthy decisions for themselves and think about alternative modalities of health is directly related to the education that they've had and their capacity to think independently overall. So we had a great conversation on Steve's show and I wanted to invite him onto mine to continue this conversation because I think this is a really important thing to talk about and to make sure that we look at head on the fact that when we think about educating our children, we're not just thinking about, can they do math? Can they read? Can they write? We need to think about how we're raising them as whole humans, which has a lot of different facets. There are a lot of different things that make up a human. It's our ability to have interpersonal relationships. It's our ability to have connections with other aspects of the world that we want to be interfacing with. It's our ability to think. It's our ability to make decisions about what we want out of life. It is our health and our happiness and our well-being. And talking about these different facets of life is really important in thinking about how we want to raise our children. And so in today's conversation, we talk about Steve's own journey as someone who grew up in a very traditional environment on the very traditional status quo path and how he stepped outside of that in his young adulthood and took a very different path than he had planned and the things that he learned along the way. We talk about some of the things that he's learned as a health coach working with people from different walks of life who are struggling with things because of the way that they were educated and some of the things that he's learned about the harms that are done by school, not just on people's academic or career abilities, but also on their health. And we get pretty philosophical about what it means to be a happy and successful person in the modern world and how we can make sure we're equipping our kids to be successful in life. This was a really fun episode and I hope you enjoy listening. All right, well, Steve, I am so excited to have you on the show. This feels like a proper podcast moment, maybe the first one that I've had on the show because you found me through a podcast mm -hmm. and then you had me on your show and then we had such a great conversation with so much overlap between your world of health and my world of education mm -hmm. that I said, well, we have to have you on my show too. So this is like the first like real, this podcast thing is actually like making an impact on my world conversation that I've had on the show. So I'm very excited about this. I'm super excited too. And look at that, it's like podcast inception. It's all come full circle. <laughs> I yeah, know. It's so cool. We've just become those internet people now with podcasts. I feel like. <laughs> we're, we're doing it. Hashtag influences. Hashtag <laughs> podcast. Let's go. <laughs> I don't think that's how hashtag works. I think that you have to put that in the description oh, of the do? video. See? Yeah, I don't think you can just say it. I don't know. We're still kind of figuring this out, we'll but I think it. hashtag podcast. Let's go. <laughs> I think we just got a follower. I think that actually worked. Okay. Um, um, but you haven't been podcasting all that long, really. You've been at this for how many months? Like six, eight? Pretty much since the new year. So mm -hmm. January, we recorded our first batch and we published our first episode in February. 
Um, that's a podcast called Radical Health Radio. We shoot out of Austin here in Dripping Springs. Um, so that's, you know, like with Rebel Educator, we're taking a more rebellious stance on the whole health thing, you know, how to fight back against big food and just the conventional wisdom, uh, that or lack thereof, conventional wisdom that's in our culture around what it really means to live healthy. So I'm interviewing radical people that are, you know, living life radically. Um, that's some health people, that's some influencers, that's some movers, and that's people like yourself that are questioning the matrix dropping out and, and doing things a little more intentional so i like to say like living life by design and not by default so it's been really fun it's kind of new like you said now we've published about 30-ish episodes as of this one going out and actually tomorrow your episode will go out on my show and then this will come out in another bit of time so it'll all be very full circle again but it's been fun it's i'm learning a lot and i'm sure like you are too it's just really cool to sit down with rad people and have good chats and you've done a phenomenal job both with the presentation of the show itself, but also building an audience around it. I was very surprised to find out that it had only been around for yeah. a few months. You're killing it. You're doing a great job. Um, but part of the reason I'm so excited to have you here today is because I think the work that you're doing and the work that I'm doing and other people in the education space are doing are much more closely intersected mm -hmm. than is apparent to the outside observer. And I think that's an important thing to say out loud and to really explore and talk about. And I think a lot of the things that have impacted your own thought processes on your journey of going from the very conventional mainstream uh, the sort of way of being about health and fitness has like the, the journey that you had to go through to kind of step outside of the matrix and see it for what it is and see the other options that are out there that are perhaps much more intuitively aligned, mm -hmm. but aren't necessarily commonplace knowledge mm -hmm. to the average person just sort of going, taking the default path about their health is very similar to the journey that, most parents have to take or individuals who are educating themselves mm -hmm. to step outside of the education matrix. And I think you've walked this path very elegantly and I'm very excited to talk about your journey and some of the ways like on a deeper level that you've thought about it. But I also think when we talk about education, we think about it as a very siloed mm -hmm. thing in the same way as when we talk about health, we think about it as a very siloed thing. We think in terms of subject areas mm -hmm as these sort of disparate, disconnected areas of reality, which I would argue is a symptom of our school system teaching us that these different subjects happen in disparate rooms around a building at different times of day. And yes. you maybe apply some of your other learnings in different areas. You maybe apply some math in your science class. You're probably not applying very much science and math though. And everything is just sort of disconnected entities mm -hmm. but when you're thinking about the education of a child or the health of a child you're thinking about a whole human as mm -hmm. an ecosystem and all of the pieces are important and health is one of the really fundamental ones and so I'm really excited to go down the rabbit hole today of how some of these pieces interrelate mm. and how some of the myths that we have about all of the different pieces of of building a human from infancy up to fully self-directed, self-sustaining, self-sufficient adulthood are, you know, negatively impacting each other, how this whole ecosystem is broken, not just one piece of it. Um, so I think a lot of parents who are thinking about alternatives in one area start to think about alternatives in all of the different areas pretty yeah. quickly. Uh, so I think we'll go down some fun rabbit holes, or you call them wormholes today. Wormhole. They're probably longer than a rabbit hole. Um, but I'm really excited to have this conversation. Can you, to kick us off, and you have a ton of content out there already that people can go find if they want to hear mm -hmm. your story, but can you maybe just give like the bullet points of mm -hmm. kind of who you are, what you do, just for context for listeners who haven't had the pleasure of listening to your podcast yet? They will, <laughs> who haven't checked it out yet. Yeah, if we don't scare them away. So hopefully <laughs> we, we, we bring them in, yeah, join the cult. And I say that lovingly because the root word of culture comes from cult. So I think, you know, we're already living in a cult. We need 
better cults. And kind of like you said, it's it's a horseshoe where it seems like these things are very, you know, on, on different stages of the journey, but they all kind of come back around and center. And, you know, how we do one thing is how we do all things. And I think that you're right, this education conversation, this health conversation, and you said a key word there, which is looking at the person as a whole. And that's why I choose to adopt the term as a holistic health coach. Uh, I don't think that you can compartmentalize health. And if you're doing that, you're not talking about health. You're talking about aspects of health, like fitness or mental skills. But holistic health is much like a holistic education model, is much like looking at all systems in the truest expression and of, of holism. So that's kind of where I am now. And how I arrived here was, like you said, going through more of a uh, conventional journey. Like I was conventionally schooled and I did not enjoy the schooling we spoke about on our, our podcast. I had a memory as you were talking about some statistics around anxiety and going back to school that I used to, you know, finish the summer vacations, get ready to go back to school and was so sad about going back that I would like, almost cry myself to sleep. I don't want to go back into that place because it felt a little bit like a prison to me. I wasn't able to play and explore. Um, so, you know, I was kind of naturally a curious kid and it felt like that was squashed in school. But the one thing that, that was um, the, the curiosity allowed me to follow when I was around 16 um, was this idea idea of Basically, I came from a family that there was a lot of ill health. My my parents were heavy. There was a lot of early death in my family from chronic lifestyle factors, um, cancer being the big one, the big C word. And I was terrified. I have a memory of growing up and hearing my mum talk to my dad in the kitchen about potentially just preemptively having a breast removed because there was so much breast cancer in our family and thinking like, wow. And in our culture, you've kind of got this um, myth, I use that word, something that kind of never really happened, but it just kind of runs its course as a capital T truth that your genes are the be all and end all. So as a person growing up, we had the fat gene, we had the cancer gene. I'm like, man, we got a bloody loaded gun here. And now I, I take a different view of that. I say that your genes load the gun, but, but your environment pulls the trigger. Or your genes may predispose, but they do not predetermine. And there was something in me as a self-conscious chubby kid with this like, oh, I'm gonna have a horrible future and I'm probably gonna die early. And I had body confidence issues and all of that stuff. That there was just something in me that was like, well, let me just dig a little bit to see if there is an alternate view and theory of this. And lo and behold, there is. And this was, you know, when I was 16, 17, this is when podcasts were really first becoming a thing. And I remember just trying to consume as much information from from these people that are kind of broke off from the conventional too. And at the time I was an athlete, but I was struggling with performance and pain and such. And I've often joked in the past that I was a, a dietitian's wet dream. I was doing everything right, like to the T, you know, I was counting the calories. I was eating all the foods that they told us to do. I was low fat this, I was whole grains, I was carb loading and I was okay. I was doing okay. I'd, I'd kind of come on the other side of my chubby adolescence and got to a relatively lean, decent athlete level, but I always carried extra weight. I certainly carried extra inflammation as an aspiring MMA athlete. My knees were always beat up. I had horrible gut issues. I had skin issues and I was doing everything right. Um, so now as I'm going down this rabbit hole that became a wormhole that put me in an entire different universe of you know hearing other people talk about well some of the conventional stuff that you hear around diet might not be true and the the big red pill for me my first kind of waking up moment in the diet sphere was just listening to one guy who was a you know an olympic level athlete who decided to go gluten free in his diet and remove gluten containing grains and at the time i was like well i'm living off gluten containing grains i was oats you know my whole wheat oats with my skim milk in the morning uh, and my whole wheat wrap for lunch and you know some bread here and there and that was all good because those are healthy whole grain carbohydrates right loads of fiber really good for you lo and behold 30 day experiment of removing that stuff from my diet i i feel better my skin has cleared up my bowels have cleared up i'm not farting anymore my joints feel better i've lost like 10 pounds of inflammation and puffiness from my body so that's one of those moments where you go oh well if that what i believe so strongly to be true and everybody says is true might be wrong for some people like it was for me what else is wrong and they're in you know 10 years well 15 years later the journey continues as i continue to you know poke holes in things and question things and turn myself into a human lab rat and try things and explore things and that journey just kept unfolding and i kept learning and um kind of at an impasse in life of uh, you know six or seven years ago now where um 
I, I was kind of wondering what to do with life. Where do I go? And I kind of had this moment of divine inspiration of learning all of this stuff and helping friends, but for free, never in a professional setting or anything like that. Before even health coaching was a thing, this was like very much at the beginning of this upkick. I was like, I should, I should do this. I could do this. I could do this as a legitimate thing. I could get paid for it. I know enough. I'm, I'm confident now. So I was sitting on a beach in Costa Rica. It was New Year's Eve and we were going back to America um, in a week's time with my now wife, who was my girlfriend at the time, to get married and do all the paperwork. And I was going to chase down a green card. But like, what do you do? You know, um, and now this big entrepreneurial spirit, the American dream. I'm a British lad going back to America. I'm like, I don't want to do a normie thing. I don't want to do a nine to five like desk slave job. I have all of this knowledge. And I went to uni and I did all that too, by the way. I did sports therapy and physiology and kinesiology. So I did the whole higher education thing as well. And I always did good at it. Um, but it wasn't that clear path then that was set for me that, you know, you do education, you do the job and it's, you know, the white picket fence, two and a half kids, cat and a dog and, you know, live for retirement. I wanted to do something more. So I had this lived experience. I'd been helping people. And that was when that idea was born. I was like, I'm going to be a health coach. And since then it's been evolving and I've grown a lot as a person and I've adopted a more a more holistic view now from a very compartmentalized view of what health was. It started with just nutrition coaching. And then I was like, okay, well, this can get people lean and strong, but they are still broken inside a lot of the time. So where's the mind here? And then where's the relationships? And then where's the spiritual connections? And where's the meaning? And all of a sudden it just built into this more holistic viewpoint. Fast forward to today, that's been evolving as I evolve. I often say you can only take a client on a journey as far as you've been. So as my journey keeps going, I can pull people a little further and say like, hey, what about this too? And now it's it, it culminates in, in this message, continuing to spread, continuing to educate, Radical Health Radio, my one-on-one -on -one coaching, practice and that's kind of what what brings us up to speed to today one of the things that i think is really important about what you just said and there's a lot that's important in this but you said that the health path that you were on the sort of standard advice of what being healthy is you said is wrong for some people mm. and i think that distinction is really important i think it's maybe more obvious in health than it is in education. At least it is to me. I don't know. Correct me if you think I'm wrong about this as like a broader assessment mm. of how people perceive health. But I feel like it's a little more obvious that there are all these different diets and all these different fads and trends and people jump on them and some people have amazing results and some people really struggle. And it seems like it's slightly more accepted wisdom that like not every health program is right for every person. And I think, I don't know, you probably have a better sense than I, I may be too far outside of the matrix to have a sense. Maybe most people do assume that there's one mm. path that's right for everybody, but I feel like it's a little more obvious because you can see it. It's like, well, this person's losing weight and this person isn't. Yes. So this is working for one person. It's not for another, but that same wisdom right for some not always for others applies to every aspect of a human yes not just health and i think we really dramatically underestimate that across all all aspects and mm. faces of reality which i imagine you run into a lot in mm. your work as a coach yeah for sure and and i think now i see people as as different on the inside as they are on the outside. And of course, there are some fundamental laws of physiology and there are some some fundamental truths you can say. What gets tricky in, in the health sphere is it becomes religiously dogmatic when somebody believes that they have the way. And the, the best example of this right now in the health sphere is the carnivores versus the vegans. They've got two extreme ends of the spectrum. These people only eat meat and drink water and salt. And these people only eat things that grow from the ground and no life is sacrificed. And if you see at the extreme ends of the spectrum, they both believe that they fundamentally have the capital T truth. And there is no, you know, there's no nuance there because they're trapped in a belief system. And the, the inherent problem with the belief system is that it is closed. So 
I kind of had this early on, and I think we all do to a degree. You've probably heard of Dunning-Kruger effect, right? The less you know, the more stubbornly you know it. Yes. <laughs> so when I first started to read books and I fixed my own health, I thought I was a, an expert. I was going to shout it from the rooftops. Everybody should do paleo. Everybody should do this. And that's what people do. And then the more you start to learn, the more you realize, oh, shit, I don't really know that much. And there are nuances with every person. And like I said, there are some fundamental laws, laws of thermodynamics, the reason that diets do work is because of some key fundamental laws but how people get there many paths up the mountain you know there's many roads that lead to rome so it's now taking that stance that my message won't resonate for everybody in terms of how i instruct what i think is a proper human diet and i just want you to find the best diet for you which is the one you can stick to and if that means that you've got to go vegan for a time then Go be it, even if I don't personally agree with it. It can work for some people. It clearly does. So I, I just really want to avoid the trap of sitting in any seat and, sit and saying, like, I have the truth. Like, it is this way. Look at the science or that scientism or that kind of, you know, religious ideology fever that we get around dietary ideologies. I have my opinions, of course, like you do with education, like I do with education now. And I'll defend them and I'll speak my truth on them with as much fire and love as I can. But I'll always remain curious. I'll always remain open to the possibility of being wrong. And I'll always actually seek out people that challenge my belief system so I can either shore it up or go, you know what, maybe I need to evolve my stance here. So the dietary space and the health space is very interesting in that sense, because there's a lot of people that probably realize like me that there are many different paths up the mountain and they'll have their toolkit and they'll use it but there are some people that are just like nope this this is it this is the only way and i don't want to hear about you or your way because you're wrong and i don't think that a that's helpful in the discourse i don't think that you convince people to change their mind by telling them that they're wrong or making them feel stupid i think you just have to ask good questions you have to stay curious and you have to have conversations how do you navigate that in the role of a coach? Because you have a set of parameters mm -hmm. of things that you're promoting and sharing and advocating for. I don't know what language you would use, but like yeah. there are things that you're teaching people. And yet at the same time, you're also very open to the different options as a whole that people might be choosing from that are right for them. What is like from almost like a moral is maybe too strong of a word, but as you're thinking about like the ethics of your own mm how you want to show up supporting people, but also being open to other options. How do you think about that in your role? Yeah, it's a good question. I think the thing that I have to lean into as much as I possibly can is to be just a walking, talking, living, breathing embodiment of everything that I say. So I practice what I preach and it's because of my own inability to be a talking head. In the social media sphere, there's a lot of people that say one thing and behind the screen do another. That doesn't sit right with me, it never has. So what you hear from me is what is what you get. You know, what you see is what you get. So there's an essence of what I preach is because it's what I've practiced and I believe in it because I'm doing it. And I've updated my viewpoints on many things in the past through experience, not necessarily through just watching the next shiny object on YouTube or like, oh, well they said it's this and I'm gonna do this. It's like, again, that planted a seed of hope or a seed of doubt. Let me explore it. Let me see what happens. So yes, like my terminology around dietary philosophy, for example, would be that I espouse an animal-based diet, which pretty much consuming um, ruminant meats as one of the most nutritious foods on the planet. Already you see that right, animal-based diet kind of goes against many common narratives in culture, like, but, but cardiovascular disease and saturated fat and cholesterol and do you not care about the environment and cow farts and cow burps and all of those things we can we could go deeper on if you'd like to but as soon as you say that you lose some people and that's the problem with terms right that's the when you say you know homeschooling or public schools are kind of rotting from the inside out you're going to have some people go yeah because they see that and you're going to have some people immediately put the walls up because maybe they feel some guilt at the fact that they're sending the kids to these institutions that they know are broken or that they don't want to hear it you know well i did this and i'm fine so it's like I just have to again speak my truth or not 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 necessarily speak my truth as much as not shrink my truth to make anybody else feel comfortable and just say look this is what's worked for me first and foremost this is why I believe it's true from a fundamental scientific lens of understanding physiology and now I have hundreds of people 
that have gone through my program and also achieve results. So it's not just me, you know, echoing into the void and basically pontificating on some nonsense that I've just made up in my head. I've got some proof now. And I do believe that it's in line with like evolutionary theories and thinking. And then you layer this holism principle on top of it, the mindset work, the, the introspection, the movement side of things. And you start to build a little more meat on that bone, pun intended. So it's um, staying open to that, but not but also like standing for something, you know, not telling everybody, oh yeah, do whatever you want, it will all work. Like I actively will take a stand against um, veganism if I'm asked to my thoughts on it, because I don't believe it is the proper human diet. I actually think that it's probably causing more harm than it is good. And I think vegans, for example, have the heart in the right place, no doubt about it. And I think they've just been fed some half truths or complete mistruths. And now they're pursuing something that is not good for the environment or is not good for their health operating on this house of cards that it is both of those things. So I'll always defend my positions, but I'm also not going to ram them down your throat, you know? I think the, I did this and I'm fine per, uh, mentality is very, it's very common in any conversation where you start to deviate from the normal trajectory. Mm -hmm. And it's very, I think, triggering to a lot of people. It's it's very hard to look at somebody saying this whole system is wrong and to acknowledge that while also having gone through that system or mm -hmm. gone down that path. Um, I think this is probably a shared experience among most people who are questioning the status quo in any arena of reality. Uh, you very quickly, because it, like it feels like an affront against mm -hmm. both you but also the people that came before you like if you're questioning uh the diet that you grew up on that's can be very hard for the people around you yeah. to hear it's like well we ate that and we're okay we fed this to you does this mean that you know you think that we've hurt you somehow inadvertently same with the to, school system oh go ahead i, I had to like you know this was a few years ago now but i realized i was talking more and more about this and i had to you know have this conversation with my parents have said like, you know, when you know better, you can do better. I, I don't want you guys to ever hear this and think that I resent you because you failed me or you were bad parents because they didn't know. And we've had conversations since then. My parents are, are now like on board with this lifestyle. They get this message and they're like, we just didn't know. So we did, we fed you all the crap. It's not because we didn't care. We didn't know. We're actually told this stuff is totally fine. Nobody's having these conversations. So I think you're right. You know, and when I first started to go down an alternate path, that was exactly the message I was met with from people close to me well you know you, you you turned out fine and it's like well did i because I, I wasn't i wasn't thriving i was alive and then when you get that on a cultural level like well look at all these people that go to school and they turned out fine and you say well again they're alive but are they fine we look at things like anxiety and depression and suicidal ideation and actual suicide and we look at the outcomes you know for happiness and meaning and purpose so yeah okay it's 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 there's a very big difference between surviving and thriving. And I think that that's an important point to try and make when you're saying like, you know, all of this stuff is broken. It's not to point the finger of blame and say like, and if you ascribe to it, you're a horrible person. It's just like, what are we supposed to do if we see that it's broken? Are we supposed to just shut up to make people feel better? You know, it's not our job to shrink our truth again, to make any Buddy, feel comfortable or to appease other people. It's like, I see this thing now. I don't want you to repeat it. And we've got to evolve. That's what we're here to do. We have to get better. And if we don't, then, you know, I don't know where we're heading, but it doesn't look too good to me if we don't do that, you know? How did you navigate the discomfort of stepping off the conventional path and knowing that doing that and talking about that was going to cause some discomfort in the people that you love? Because I think that stops a lot of people from pursuing things that they otherwise would have. It's not just the social pain of being questioned by the people around you it's the social pain of having to inflict some of the pain on the other people by implication of what you deviating from the path means about what you think about the path everyone else is on how did you navigate that i think i was more compelled to do it it was like i often think about this this idea i guess do we have ideas or do ideas have us and this was like an idea that had me when I listened to it. I, I was aware of that stuff. It was present. It was on the table. But I was also aware that, again, if I didn't do it for the fear of judgment on making other people 
feel a certain way that the the it actually hurts them and it hurts me. So now, whilst there might be some temporary discomfort to walk through as you walk away from certain things, it's actually you're doing it to share more when you come back, more integrated and more healthy. It's not done in an F you attitude, flipping the double bird and saying, I'm done with you guys. It's like, I'm veering off the path. It's the hero's journey. It's Joseph Campbell's like arc of the hero. You know, it always culminates in this battle of the innermost cave. He says, the cave you fear to enter holds the treasure you need the most. And the hero slays the dragon, whatever that dragon is. It could be limits of the mind. It could be actually slaying a dragon. It might be leaving a relationship, leaving a country. And then you get the treasure. And then what do you do? Do you become Schmeagle and sit in the cave and say, my precious, and are you want to bring it home? No, you want to bring it back to your village. You want to bring it back to your people. You want to bring it back to your tribe. But there has to be a journey. Like Frodo Baggins had to leave the Shire. Luke Skywalker had to leave his, his mom and his daddy. He had to go and find the mentors and he had to go on this journey. And then they return home with the wisdom. So it was kind of like, it was. It, I was very compelled to do that because I always had a felt sense that I wanted to just have more than what I had. Not from a materialistic standpoint, like more money or more cars, but more truth, more of a life that felt it was by design and not by default. So therefore I had to reconcile, do I stay here and live with this open loop of regret of what if, or do I pursue the what if and learn from that? And um, am I okay with the consequences of that? And I think now, you know, full circle looking back, I'm able to say that that was, that was the right decision. It almost always is. This is one of the things you see in the regrets of the dying is like famous work from an end of uh, end of life palliative care nurse. People don't regret often what they did. It's mostly what they didn't do. It's the open loop of like, I wish I'd have done that at that time. I, it, it's always the same stuff. So I think if you have that tension and you're holding that tension of like, but what what will it make them feel like? It's to A, just communicate that firstly, but do what is best for you. Not in a selfish way, but there's a little bit of selfishness in it, but because it's what you have to do. You know, this is this is what you're here to do is to become the highest expression of yourself. You're not going to be able to become your highest self if you limit yourself and you stay in those old patterns or those old literal homes or whatever that is, you know. And you went on a really interesting journey to unwind some of this. Like you traveled all over the world. Mm -hmm. You experimented with multiple different paths and I want to dig more into that part of your story because I feel like a lot of what you are, the, like the, the ideas around what make a, a good life that you're living by now, it's not just, doesn't just come from books. It doesn't mm -hmm. just come from hypothesis. It comes from lived experience of having taken what you thought was important and then tested it against many different ways of living and being how you traveled around the world for four years is that right yeah the best part of four years was backpacking that's amazing how did that change what you feel is important in the life that you want to lead and like what mindsets about the world did you pick up from that experience that have shaped how you're living now everything absolutely everything like literally um I say that an initiation is when everything you believe to be true yesterday is no longer true today. And it was just initiation after initiation after initiation because it, 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 it just broke the mold of what a good life was when I went out there. And the reason I was compelled to travel was because I met a girl who is now my wife, Nicole, at a summer camp back in 2013. And we had this whirlwind summer romance and I felt like I'd, I'd, I'd known this lady forever and we were so bonded, but I lived in England. This was my last summer at the summer camp and she lived in New York and that's serious long distance. And neither of us were really down to play that game, especially with the intensity that we felt this relationship deserved a real shot and that was going to be challenging. So she's going on this solo trip to Thailand at the end of the summer and she's going for four weeks, I think. She's going to do a little bopping around Asia. Firstly, I really admired that she was going there solo and I 
when people ask you growing up, what do you want to be when you're older? I never had an answer, but I always said for some reason that I wanted to travel the world. And I don't really know where that came from, but I had this wanderer archetype that was like latent inside of me. And all of a sudden, here's this opportunity of a girl that I'm super connected with, super into, who's going to do it, but she's only doing it for four weeks. And I am going back to a job and all of this stuff. So I kind of made a decision in my head that if I could convince her to stretch this out to like a year or eight months and we could come back to camp that that would give me uh, more permission to go because I wouldn't have to go home and basically try and get some extra time off from work and this you know the conventional model I was following was you know you get a job now you're 23 come on grow up and you get a good paying job so you can have the nice car and you can have the nice clothes and you can have the nice watches and that's what being successful is so she is as crazy as I am and she agreed so our you know relationship trial by fire was spending the first eight months of our relationship backpacking together every waking moment together um, bucking a one-way flight to Bangkok Thailand and, and going with the flow from there but because of going out there and seeing then the fundamental reality of different cultures um, um, going to far reaching places, not just far Asia, but like the far reaching places within those countries where a lot of tourists don't go. And like being the token white person where nobody speaks English, like few people have that experience today. You know, almost everywhere you go, you can get by because you just assume everybody knows English, right? Well, they didn't. You have to communicate in a different way. And I saw families who had nothing from a materialistic standpoint they didn't have, even have shoes the, the the homes that they lived in were comprised of you know washed up wood and sheet metal on the roofs and such but there was like a really palpable happiness and and they were bonded and you could see this like cultural thing where everybody was working towards a shared goal and collective and in out in the west you know this kind of individualism you know it's just all about me and what my family gets or, or just or just me you know just like more 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 and if you win i lose and it's very competitive like that was shattered over there it was very um it was a very like egalitarian and like i'll work for you in these small clusters you know in this kind of dunbar's number in real life i was fascinated by evolutionary psychology and i was like seeing more of this like indigenous style lifestyle play out right there eating natural foods that was the f one of the first red pills as well like this paleo diet we're supposed to eat a species appropriate diet and you go into the cities in asia like bangkok and it's nothing like they grew up and they're eating all fried foods and such and you see these uh these asian people are getting heavier you go to the islands where they're living off fish and coconuts and they're lean and strong and they vibrantly can climb up and down trees and they've got big wide feet that just have amazing toe splay and athletic because they've never put themselves in shoes they've never domesticated themselves so every step of the journey of travel was just like whoa 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 like this is so different to what i thought it was and that's why you know to rewind a little bit what i said a few minutes ago when i was sitting on that beach in costa rica that year of like what do i do because i don't want a normy kind of life that's exactly why because how are you supposed to go from that level of adventure and curiosity with pretty much your biggest stresses of the day which waterfall are we going to go visit or are we going to go spend four nights in the jungle hiking and camping to like oh man how do we you know, find a place to live and pay rent and do the J-O-B thing. So it was a, it was an interesting, you know, trial by fire. It was a beautiful period of my life. I said I went to university and graduated, but that was my education. Like that was my higher education. I learned more in that four years about myself, about relationships, about life and about people than my previous 23 years of life had even come close to teaching me. So travel is something I'm a huge proponent of. And you know, there's different phases of life where it makes it easier and harder to do it, but it's always there and the world is a wonderful place and it longs to be explored. And I think that people can learn an awful lot from doing it. How did what you thought you wanted out of life differ at the end of that period of backpacking as opposed to how you felt when you started? I thought that I wanted to be rich. I thought I wanted to be rich in a materialistic standpoint. Like I wanted to have a really cool car and um, a really big house. And you know, like if you reverse engineer what that is, especially in the male psyche, it's signaling your ability to acquire resources. And what that's all about is hopefully attracting the right kind of mate. 
you know that's what that's why men do it that's why they wear big watches that's why they have to show off if they like i'm wearing an 11 dollars casio now maybe that's because i'm married and i don't care anymore but if i was a singleton in austin and i was trying to signal my you know position amongst the the other chimps i would be flashing bling you know i'd be saying you know look at me i, I so that's what it was it was always like rooted in insecurity and fear and i think a lot of that acquisition of materials and chasing multiple six figure seven figure salaries it's often that it's a cope for something else we evolved as hunters now we we don't need to hunt our food and provide for our family units necessarily we we evolutionary hunt instead so we hunt careers and businesses and bling and cars and that's what i thought i wanted because that's what society modeled as success and come the end of that experience i couldn't care less i wanted to be rich in the currency of happiness very very big difference you know not just rich in the currency of like look how many zeros are in this bank account and it it just it changed that completely because you know money is an obvious elephant in the room we all need a certain amount of it and and i see money a lot as energy like the amount of energy that i can pull in means the amount of energy i can give back to the world but i don't need to become you know selfishly sitting on top of my stack of gold coins and hoarding that for for whatever reason i just want to live in a way where i provide value and i live in a way that i am rich in the currency of happiness and i give that and i share that freely and money comes back to me but it reframed like the targets of how much money do I actually need and what kind of life do we actually need and what level of material wealth do we actually want versus what are we just doing to impress or keep up with the Joneses. So my wife and I, we live a very, very simple life. We live in the middle of nowhere. We have no neighbors. We have five acres of land where we homestead off it. We have animals. We grow our own food. We're raising our child. Uh, my wife's about to have a, a second baby here in, in about a month's time. And, you know, we don't have fancy things and bling because we have a life that is really rich, you know, it's really present, it's really connected to the land. And I could sell my soul, as they say, and, you know, pursue more and get more material wealth, but what does that cost you? Like, what does it cost you to earn an extra $50,000 a year? Because in my experience, and I, some of my clients are incredibly wealthy people financially, but they're almost like, they have like a, a materialistic obesity and a spiritual starvation like it doesn't matter how much fluff or trinkets they have there's something inside of them like the old cliche that money can't buy you happiness and that was the biggest like kind of mind bender for me because i thought money could buy you happiness and i don't believe that anymore i think there's a certain amount of money you need to survive and there's a lot of people that are, are living in really bad poverty and i think we could be doing better to help those people and serve those people but after a certain amount Mo money, mo problems. I think that was notorious B.I.G. Like he he was onto something, you know, and I think that we've got to be really intentional about what we're chasing and that it's OK to own things until things own us. And I was going down the path of my things would own me, my house, my title, my my car. Those things would have become the things that owned me. Now, if I want a shiny object, I can get it. And I'm like, oh, I enjoy this shiny object. And it wouldn't matter if it was gone the next day because it's just a thing and no thing, nothing makes you happy other than your internal state and your relationships and the real things, the best things in life are truly free. So I want to get a little explorative, exploratory, philosophical here, because I think there are some interesting different threads of ideas that are intersecting and in what you're talking about. I think this is really what you're saying is really important. Um, so when I was growing up homeschooled, I got to watch my parents figure out and kind of reverse engineer what they predicted I was going to need in order to be happy, healthy, successful as an adult. And because I was homeschooled, I saw the whole thing as much more of a full ecosystem as opposed to disparate parts like we talked about earlier, like, you know, learning about math or reading was often overlapped with the process of mm. making lunch, which was often overlapped with, you know, thinking about, well, this is why we're eating this food and some of it's coming from our garden and some of it, you know, this is why you need to make sure you eat some meat too or whatever, like making sure it's a balanced diet because that's what makes you healthy. Like it was much more obvious to me that everything was intersected than is perhaps the average experience of everything being very segmented and apart. But 
I was also very aware because my parents were kind of narrating their process to me of figuring out how to homeschool my sister and I. They were very aware that there's sort of this discovery process mm. that's happening when you're raising a child of figuring out what is going to be important for their long-term success and then how can we make sure that we're providing the correct things to get our child there and then i learned how to think about this much more in a much more like granular and hands-on sense when i worked for praxis a startup apprenticeship program where i that was my, my first hands-on experience working at an education company doing actual like building an education program mm -hmm. and part of my job became curriculum development and program design and so part of my job was to figure out like what does success look like in the context of people successfully completing our program mm -hmm. which you know what we were offering people was their ability to land a job at a startup and make a full-time income and sustain themselves even if they didn't have a college degree or any previous startup working experience. And so I had to take people who were, had, you know, a high school job working at a fast food restaurant or something, and that was it mm. and help them get ready to go work in a full-time job at a company that they were excited about. And so I had to think very, in a very first principle sense, like what what is the difference? What's the delta between point A where they are now and point B where I want them to be and how do we close that gap? Mm -hmm. And that's a lot of what parenting was about is figuring out how do I get my child from point A, which is, you know, childhood, which is they, they are very, no matter how self-sufficient they are as a child, they're still reliant on yep. the adults and the familial structure to sustain them. How do we get them to point B, which is self-sufficiency, but also success in the real world as an independent entity. But that whole process requires having some definition of success. And I think it's very easy for that to also start to unravel the sort of assumptions about what we think success means. Like you just described your whole perception of what success is changed when you got out of the just like very status quo standard Western mm -hmm. world and you started seeing other cultures and you started seeing the different definitions of happiness and well-being and you said wait a second why can't I have this too why do I have to default to this other path that's not mm -hmm. so perhaps not so pleasant and not so it's not going to deliver a sense of well-being to me um, and I think, you know, I talk to parents a lot about this when they're thinking about education. They're very comfortable stepping outside of maybe the public school system with their kids, but they want to homeschool them or privately school them in a way that's still going to set them up to be an obvious candidate mm -hmm. for a college to select mm -hmm. because the deviation from the path is, uh, it's sort of conditional. And it, there's a there's a limit to the mm -hmm. the parameters within which they're willing to step off. There's a really big difference between stepping off just for like K through 12 and stepping off the path completely. Yeah. And I think it's really important to ask these really fundamental questions about what is what does life success mean? Because I think even a lot of the assumptions that people have, like the sort of first degree deviations from the path, I think they're still not open enough, the questions that are being asked are not broad enough to encompass all of the different possibilities of what the answers might be. And I think you went on this journey where you took many, many steps away from the path. Mm -hmm. You were like way off course in the jungle somewhere that, you know, no one from home had ever even yeah. heard of asking questions about, well, what does it mean to be happy here? And what does it mean to be okay here because i think the okay part is an important piece of this too like what does it mean to be like okay to be have some security in your both your psychological sense of well-being but also very practically like mm -hmm. have enough food have enough money to pay for things and i'm really curious about on a deeper level like how you started to think about what success in life even means and maybe also I imagine you have a lot of conversations about what this with your clients mm -hmm. too, unraveling some of the preconceived notions about success. I'm really curious on a deeper level how you think about this because I think learning how to ask these questions is 
incredibly important for everyone, whether they're on a health journey, an education journey, a psychological mm -hmm. journey, like a mental well-being journey, something else entirely. And I think it's very counterintuitive because I don't think anyone, I don't think most people ever encounter anyone who teaches them how to ask those questions at a fundamental level. I think yeah. most of the sort of invitations into this we get are still very baked in the status quo. It's like you go to the guidance counselor's office and they're like, what do you want to do with your life? But there's, you know, a, a sheet that you can yeah. fill out some answers in. And then there's like a dozen pre-prescribed paths. And that's the idea of like, you have so many options. You can choose from anything as long as it fits on this yeah. piece of paper, yeah. not you can literally choose anything. How do you grapple with that? Yeah, it's, it's a huge um, conundrum, I think, for most people's lives and potentially increasingly so as we um, you know, see younger generations growing up where they seem to be a little more um, slower. There's, there's, a, there's a theory, I'm forgetting the name now, but it's proposed that they're, they're seeing trends in this, that younger kids are taking less risks and they're taking longer. Um, you know, They're getting driver's licenses a little bit later. They're actually not having as much sex. They're not going out and partying as much as generations uh, you know, a bit further back were because there is this inbuilt like fear and scarcity. And I think that's what it comes down to. You know, at the root of this is it's fear. People are comfortable microdosing, but nobody wants to take the macro dose. People are like, you know, give me a little bit. I'll see what it's like. But you're like, oh, yeah, you want to take five grams and like blow your head off? No, no, no. I, I can't relinquish that control. So what is that? Well, to me, that is the reminder of our mortality. I think it's a fear of death. And I think that death is the great motivator. And I think that if you are willing to go beyond a microdose of dipping your toes in into the full dissolution of everything you believe to be true, no longer being true, you have to be willing to let some parts of you die. And I think that our culture has become so fearful of death. We've removed it from the home. We don't talk about it. We act like we're all not going to die. I mean, the Stoics, of course, practice memento mori and amor fati. They reminded themselves all the time that you will die. And people feel like that's a morbid stance to take now because oh, I don't, I don't want to think about that. You know, that's hopefully in a hundred years from now. But no, remembering that you will die reminds you that you must live a good life because it's coming for you. Like death is the grand graduation ceremony. We are all going to graduate at some point you know and it i think the relationship that you have to death will dictate how you live life you know if you are fearful of death as the end like just that's it then it could cause you to live in such fear and scarcity in a way that is very constrictive and holding on so desperately because i don't want it to be the end this is so good but in the fact that you're holding on and living with such fear doesn't allow you to actually live a good life now if you adopt more of a um, classically religious view of death, where if you've been a good boy, you go to heaven, but if you've been a bad boy, you're gonna burn in hell and damnation. You probably live with a ton of fear and shame and guilt, and that's weird too. What if you believe that death is not the end, that death, as Ramdas used to say, is like taking off a tight shoe. It's like a, <sighs> for your soul, right? You will leave this body, but the essence of you has probably been here before and might live on again. The, then that instructs how you live today, because you see that on this wheel of samsara, to borrow a term from Buddhism, that if it is continual and that you will continue, or the essence of you will continue at least, then maybe what is required of you is to live the best life that you can live now, because you are also benefiting the ancestors that came before you, that put you here, and the future generations that will come after you. And you're contributing to the evolution of consciousness and, and humanity and that those frames are interesting. And I think the people that are very fearful when re reminded of that, it, it shows you why they choose certain things. And I think a part of it is, like I said, cultural because of the fear of death. And I think that a part of it is the loss of good role models, the loss of elders uh, in our in our cultures. We have olders, not elders. The olders are just these old people now that have become inconvenient. They're taking our social security. Let's put them in homes. They they poop themselves, put them in diapers. Like nobody look at them. They're going to die soon. I hope it's just you know. I hope it's painless. Whereas for the longest time evolutionary speaking, the elders held the wisdoms of our cultures. They sat around the fires. They were the storytellers. They were the myth keepers. They inspired the stories to continue living on in the youth. And what stories do we have now? You know, like what, what is our 
grand myth like what is our true archetypes that we're trying to create right now you've got like consumerism and you've got you know these the things that we worship are the biggest buildings on the horizon and what are they at what do they point at so i think that a loss of really conversations like this from parents that have the scope to say actually want more for you outside of my level of comfort for you like you said you can you can be whatever you want to be as long as it fits just on the edge of my comfort zone because when i you know think about raising my son into the future and we start having these conversations when he's a little bit older i have to be very aware of putting my limits on him because the limits that i put on him is me saying you can't do that because i don't believe that i could do that it's got nothing to do with you but a parent's word, an adult's word, or culture's word become child's realities. And I think they're all living in a very like safety bubble kind of existence where everything is scary, everything is fearful. And American culture is really good at scaring people. You know, we didn't meet many Americans traveling because there is this inherent belief that it's really dangerous out there. Don't go out there. What are you, you're going to Colombia? They, they, they're still drug dealers. They'll kidnap you and ransom you. Like you hear this from people. And we've never gotten any trouble traveling. We've only ever met love and great people. And we've broken down in random countries and people have helped us and they couldn't even speak the language and they wouldn't take anything for it. They wouldn't take our dollars. They wouldn't take our money. They just were helping. You know, you see this real best hopeful side of humanity when you break outside of the box, not the humanity that we think is out there because it's all we're beamed, you know, through the news media. If it bleeds, it leads. Everything is death and destruction and chaos and everybody's out to get you. And those have become people's realities. So the level now at which we can break free, unplug from the matrix and choose to live a more intentional life is inherently limited. Like it's like a, a bottleneck that we're being squeezed through or like an hourglass that the sand is running through. And I feel like we're getting to the pinch point. Now, if we can navigate it well and we can restore some kind of wisdom and the elders can come back and conversations like this can just plant little ripples and, and plant seeds in people, then when it opens up on the other side, if it opens up on the other side, it opens up into possibility. It doesn't need to stop with this the end, right? It can open up again into like, hey, you know what? We're, we're as far as I can feel it or what feels most resonant to me, that we're some kind of spiritual being having a human experience and we're on the greatest playground imaginable. We can eat food, we can have sex, we can fight, we can create things with our mind, we can tell stories, we can sing songs, we can dance. Like there's real evil supervillains, there's a climate crisis, there's all this stuff going on. There's like new levels, new devils. And if we came here and we chose this, and this is a video game where we didn't choose to come here and have nothing go on. Like people worry about all of these problems. And it's like, what did you expect? Did you come here to have no problems and have everything taken care of? Like you came here to evolve. Like you came here to experience yourself and to expand consciousness. And therefore the, the, the mind needs a problem. Like the body needs food. So working through all of that then presents you, I believe, with the opportunity and maybe what I'd call the responsibility to choose to live in that way, to not be limited by fear, because that is living in hell, I think. I, I don't necessarily believe like heaven and hell are afterlife things. I think they said the kingdom of heaven is within, so why would hell be without? It's, it's a reality you get to choose. What do you see? Perception is reality. If you choose to see hell and it's all terrible, you will live in hell. Right? If you choose to see that we're, heaven is here and population is everyone, you get to choose that. Then you get to play in the infinite game of life and you get to create and you get to co-create and you get to love and you get to laugh. And that doesn't mean spiritual bypassing of saying like nothing's, yeah, but, but there, are, there are real problems in the world. There's no doubt about it. But it's the way in which you get to choose to respond to those instead of being so constricted by fear and playing it so safe. Because to me, that's scarier than death. So I, I have to live in a way that is more alive, even if it means risking it, even in my animal brain, if that means, oh, but that's dangerous, don't do it. You'll be kicked from the tribe. You'll be left alone and starved to death and you will die. I have to find something that's not the mind, something that is more courageous. And the Stoics talked about it a lot, really listening to the wise self, not the wounded self, like listen to the heart, not the head and pursue that path instead, because I think that fear is the compass. And if you can follow it, the, the, the treasure is yours for the taking. How do you think about with your own children, setting them up for life success and your definition of what that 
is because you've been on a long journey of unwinding a lot of the preconceived notions that you were fed early on that we're all fed mm -hmm. early on this diet of you must do these things in this order mm -hmm. at, at this level in order to a attain this level of okayness how do you think about the fundamental things that you want your children to know or be able to do mm -hmm. or understand in order to be successful on your terms and also what is your what is your definition of success like when you look at your children as adults and i'm sure your answer to this will be evolving as you go through this process you're still early in the journey but when you think about what a successful version of your children is as adults what does that even mean to you yeah i do think about this and it and it does change and i think it will continue to change but one of the frames that i've found interesting to play with is trying to be a grandchild optimizing machine so i'm i'm of course i'm thinking about raising my children but i'm actually thinking about raising my grandchildren through them by the lessons and wisdom that i can impart on my children you know and and i think what that means is that i have to be a person of integrity uh, my wife and I have to do what is necessary for our, ourselves and our communications to live in a loving household that they get to see examples of that so they know what that looks like. So many people don't know what a loving relationship looks like because they didn't see it modeled when they're growing up. They didn't see it modeled what it mean to be courageous. They didn't see good communication models. So now they become adults and they're thrown to the wolves and they have to figure it out the hard way. How much of a competitive advantage in life is it to be raised by two lovingly, consciously connected parents who tell you, you and believe in you actually really that you can literally do whatever you want to do and you can be whoever you want to be and they will then raise their children in that way so we i think evolutionarily speaking we are grandchildren optimizing machines that's what we're trying to do and then that puts you back in the responsibility of okay what do i do now and what do i really hope to leave them with and, and what kind of lessons do i want to instill in them and i think there's there's a lot, but I think a few things really stand out for me. And if I anticipate the direction that the world's going, I think these are increasingly more important. And one is leadership. I think you've really got to embody and, and teach and inspire, uh, you know, young people to be leaders, not over organizations necessarily right now, but leaders of themselves, which branches into so much like to have discipline you know, to, to actually not just always obey the commands of your inner bitch and your lower self and listen to that nagging voice of scarcity and ego, but to command more of yourself. Like nobody can do that for you other than you. So like, how can you show up as your higher self? How do you, I hope to teach my son this because I learned it a lot later than I would have liked to have learned it. How can you develop a relationship to your emotions instead of just trying to ignore them or push them down or numb them with any kind of substance? How can you acknowledge that they are there and they point at something and there is no such thing as a good or bad emotion, it's just feedback. And now you get to develop a relationship. You get to understand what the feedback coming in is. And now you get to practice more of a stoic kind of way of having a relationship with them, but not being owned by them. And most people, they especially men, you know, in particular, they, they act like they um, are rocks, you know, not emotional, and, but they're actually ruled by their emotions. They have no relationship. They have no kind of IQ or EQ rather to, to kind of navigate those things. So some kind of embodied mindfulness practice. So whether that's like teaching them to breathe and regulate, Hey, you know, when you're feeling anxious, you know what you can do? You can take long exhales. You can go like this. And that right there is pushing the brake of your nervous system. That's the parasympathetic branch of your nervous system. Para, like parachute, that slows you down. So when you get up in your head and you're all worried about this thing and you <laughs> just, <sighs> and then teach them to meditate and teach them to read books and then teach them to hunt and teach them to lead and teach them to practice discipline and teach them things like, you know, I'm not just going to be like, oh, you're a kid, so you can eat whatever you want. No problem. Have 12 packs of Oreos. Like, but I'm also not going to tell you that you can't eat an Oreo. What I'm going to say is if you want to choose to do that, you have to live with the consequences of your actions. And here's the information that's present in that food. Food is information. And this is pretty crappy information. So you can choose to eat it. But here's probably what it's going to do in your body. And when you eat it, I want you to listen to your body. I want you to feel what that feels like. 
What does it do to your stomach? What does it do to your mood? And now start developing a relationship with everything in life, with people, with their energies, with the the way they hold themselves, the way they speak, um, you know, and, and try and just like make a really, really curious human in all aspects, because I think curiosity is a human superpower. And I know this is a huge part of your work with the, the, the rally against institutionalized education is it stomps that out of people. Like they get spat out the other end and there's like no curiosity left or it's it's forgotten at least. I feel like it's at the essence of who we are and a lot of the times it's about remembering what we've forgotten as opposed to learning anything new. And I think that's what we've got to do. Like that's, that's kind of how I see my role as a parent is to do my best in that and also remain open to the fact that they are your teachers as much as you are theirs. Like it's the one thing I've learned, especially early on in this game, there's not many lessons necessarily you can teach to a three-year-old. You can speak a lot, not with your words, you can speak a lot with your energy and your touch and your love and your play, that speaks volumes. But you can't have deep philosophical debates with a three-year-old. But what they can do is mirror back to you all of your shit. They are the most potent mirror because they'll show you your triggers. They'll show you your stuff, you know? So it's also a relationship of humbling yourself, right? I'm here as a guide, but these are not my kids in the sense that I own them. I don't own these kids. They choose, they chose us as parents to come through us, to be led by us, but they're not mine. I don't own them and therefore I have no right to put my limits on them or to tell them what they should do or how they should live life. All I have to do is do my best to try and present options and instruct and tell them, stay curious and listen to your heart and do that thing. And I think if we can do that, I think the next generation of kids that are coming up can be the change makers. I mean, they literally are the future. It sounds cliche, but without kids, we don't have a future. And I think if we keep going the way that we're going and you just look at these trends, I think the future looks bleak and it's not even the children's fault. They're just in a world that is sick. And the way in which we've built these institutions is sick and everything is just kind of like, it's it, it requires a person with enough awareness to say, no, like, no, that, that's madness at this point. You know, the old Albert Einstein doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results is insanity. And I think we're, We've been doing it for a long time now and it's not working. So we need something different, you know? Well, also the Albert Einstein, if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it'll spend its whole life thinking it's stupid. How many kids are we just mm -hmm. shuffling through these hallways, these cinder block hallways with all of these pre-prescribed notions about what you're supposed yeah. to become and they spend their whole lives thinking that they're just not very good at anything when really the thing that they're phenomenal at just didn't happen to be on the five option menu exactly i think that's i think a lot of kids get really wounded by that and a lot of potential gets left on the table um and i think you know to your point about the kids being the future i i harp on that point a lot mm -hmm. that i mean because sometimes I think it feels an obvious, like I don't even have children. Why, why do I care about how we educate them? Like, why, why does it matter to me at all? But it's, you know, what, what else matters mm -hmm. if, if the way that we're building the future isn't being done intentionally and with integrity and with a deliberate focus on how, how do we nurture the best possible the best possible outcomes and the best possible environments for, for our kids to thrive. Nothing else you do even matters. It's just gone exactly. in a generation. Yeah. Um, but I also think the way, when, when you really stop to think about it, the way we raise our kids is so strange. Like they're so ungrounded and they're so divorced from reality both the real world but also the natural world mm -hmm. when you think about it's like okay we're going we're going to grow grow these creatures into full humans so we're going to put them in cinder block rooms we're going to flood them with fluorescent lights we're going to divorce them from fresh air for all but maybe an hour a day mm -hmm when they're all allowed outside to breathe in the fumes coming up off of like the rubber, mm -hmm. the rubber <laughs> ground of the, the playground. It's not even real fresh air. We're going to feed them these very, you know, stock lunches that are mass produced, mm -hmm. uh, very healthy. And we're not going to give them any freedom of movement. We're not going to allow them to express 
the energy moving through their body in any way. We're not going to give them the opportunity to build physical strength and capacity because they have to sit still and listen. And we're going to, you know, fill their heads with the information that we deem is important on the dietary plan that we have prescribed institutionally, one size fits all, you know, best, best we can do. We're kind of going to average it out and mm -hmm. hope that it generally sort of fits everybody at large. When you think about raising kids that way, it feels so, it feels so inhumane. It feels wrong. I truly think that if the alternative education movement wins and it's built a lot of momentum, I think it has a fair shot at winning. I think on a long enough time horizon, it will. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of degrees of when, but I'm very, I'm very bullish on it. I think that if it, if it wins, we will look back in a generation or two and think that the way that we have educated kids in the Western world feels as archaic mm. as something like segregating our kids mm. or living under a monarchy in a world that's now ruled by democracy is going to feel so foreign and like such a strange relic of the past but it's strange to think that it's such a, a normal thing so normal. now but kids need to be raised outside they need to be grounded in nature they need to be in the dirt they need to be playing they need to be manipulating the world around them and they need to have a chance to both test their capacity and their strength in the world and like if i push this thing in the real physical world can i make it move mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. can i move it over here and put it with this other thing and like build a, a structure maybe a fort in the woods that keeps me dry from the rain like can i manipulate my reality into what I want it to be, but also can I have a relationship with the weather and the dirt and the seasons and the things growing out of the dirt that are creating the ecosystem around me. I think even when you live many degrees removed from that in a city somewhere, that's still the fundamental underpinning of your world. And so you need to be anchored in it. You need to understand it. And I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about how you think about that too, both with your own kids, but also, I mean, you saw kids growing up all over the world. Yeah. I'm sure you have seen a lot of different ways that kids are grounded into their physical reality. And as somebody who does holistic health coaching, I'm sure you have thoughts about this side of things. Yeah. I, I loved everything you just said, by the way. And I think we've got to do uh, an Einstein hat trick and say that he also said that you can't solve a problem from the same level of consciousness that created it. And I think that's kind of what we're talking about here. It's such an ingrained aspect of our consciousness that this, this is just the way that it is, that it will just keep replicating itself until we can go beyond that, higher than that, and you know, have a little bit of wisdom, to quote one of Naval's definition of wisdom, wisdom is knowing the long-term consequences of your actions. And I think if we are to entertain the long-term consequences of our actions with how we're raising children right now, I don't know that there's many people, if any people, that truly sat with that, that feel good about it. So why do we just keep doing it, you know? And I think that to, to you know, understand how we move forward and how we, like for my wife and I and our local communities and this movement around different style of schooling, unschooling, homeschooling, co-ops, et cetera, forest schooling. This is our language. This is our jam. You know, that whole thing that you just said is spot on. It's, it's the highest form of research is play, which is not Albert Einstein, but often gets attributed to him. It was somebody else, but the highest form of research is play. That's how kids learn interacting with their environment. That's how I saw these kids in, in, you know, far reaching parts of certain countries that they didn't, they didn't have school. And, you know, on, on one degree, people would think that's so sad, you know, they'll never learn to read and write. And at the same time, if they don't need to learn to read and write, but they know all of the plants in that local ecology and they know how to make medicines and they know how to hunt and they know how to feed the tribe and they know how all of this stuff works. What do you want? You know, wh which one is more valuable? And I think we're entering into a, a, a very quickly changing world, you know, with, AI and the craziness of that, the the fast displacing of white collar jobs and such that a lot of these kids are getting enrolled into college right now and, and fed down the pipeline for jobs that won't even exist five to 10 years from now, if not sooner, you know, and 
blue collar will will last longer than white collar jobs because skills and labor is still going to be required at least for some time although there's now 3d printed homes and all of this stuff is coming so the world is going to change a lot and if you have no relationship to the world and you were just told it was like academia and you know reciting things from books and all of a sudden you enter into a world where you're basically not useful anymore because you have nothing to offer then how good have we done by our children you know and i think things like learning to interact with the world learn like i'm amazed by my all it's three and a half years old my son and he knows the name of plants and he knows what's a pine tree and what's an oak and that's that and he tells me stuff and i'm like wow and he's where did you learn that at homeschool co-op you know he talks about spiders and things that you know other kids might have no idea about and it's not to say that one is better or worse but it's to say that one at least is more real at least it's more organic and i feel like you know when i, I live in the diet world a lot we talk about you know free range pasture range uh, animals and regenerative agriculture and that's an animal that's lived its natural existence and then you've got these caged animals, these caged animal feeding operations, domesticated animals that are not healthy. They don't produce healthy foods. They don't produce healthy soils. And that's what's happening to our children. We don't have free range kids. We, we have like factory farmed kids. We have factory farmed adults raising factory farm kids because they don't know any different. But what we need is a regenerative system, something that heals the soil, something that literally heals their little souls. There's a reason soil and soul are so close together. There's a reason that humus, the topsoil, is like human, right? We are an extension of the earth. Like the earth is where we all come from. It's where we all go back to. And if we have no relationship to that and we don't teach our children to have a relationship to that, to grow and nurture the soil and not destroy it with herbicides, pesticides, rodenticides, fungicides, because all of those sides mean death like homicide we kill the earth we kill the future we kill the curious spirit and we can't move forward from that energy like i said um you know i have a certain like a different perspective on kind of like philosophy of life and religion but i also like to study comparative world religion there's some line along the lines of this in the bible and it's until you become like children you won't inherit the kingdom of heaven so it's essentially saying we must reimagine our realities to become more childlike again and i think that missing opportunity there is that we've become just so serious and we've lost our play and we've lost our connection to the world and i think if we can refine that through you know adults teaching their kids and allowing the kids to teach them again because if if i let my kid do what he pleases he is feral that guy doesn't want, want to be in the house at all. He wants to be naked. He wants to be shoes off and he wants to be playing with leaves. He's now picking them up and smelling each one and gathering little piles and playing in the mud. And that's what he wants to do all day long. He wants to do it. You try and force him to sit down and do some kind of puzzle. And he's like, I want to go do the puzzle with the twigs outside, you know? So it's like, it's, we're, we're like grasping at it. We're trying to replicate it in a very domesticated way. And you can see that the, like the little wild child in children that wants to do it, wants the natural version of that, which I think we all want because it's where we came from and it's where we're supposed to go back to. And we're supposed to have a relationship to nature, not live inside of these cities where we have to take vacations to nature or visit a park to find nature. Like nature is us. There's a lot of indigenous cultures, they don't have a word for nature because there's no separation from nature. It's just the, nature. What do you mean? Like the home, this thing, like God, what that's, that's it. <laughs> I think that everything you just said is so important. And I think there are two pieces of this that I want to emphasize because I think, I think they're really critical to the conversation that we're having. The first one is the idea that children want to just be children, but as adults, we also crave going back to that mm -hmm. childlike sense of mm -hmm. wonder and exploration and fun and free play and i think one of the side effects of the way we educate ourselves is that we're it's not necessarily the intent but one, one could argue that perhaps it is but it's certainly a a prolific side effect that you go through this education system and you just spend a dozen plus years learning to work mm. and i mean work not in the sense of i'm working towards something that i want to accomplish which is a very good and enjoyable thing to do but work in the way that people mean the term work on a sunday night when they have the blues and they don't want to go to bed because they don't want to get back up in the morning and re-enter 
their work week reality. This sense of obligation and struggle and compulsion being com- or compelled by other by other something other than you this extrinsic necessity to go work and do things for someone else we learn that that's how the world works and that's how we have to engage with it instead of coming from a playful curious inquisitive uh, naturally energized flow state way of engaging with the world which is what kids do and if we don't train it out of them like i I see this difference pretty distinctly between Mm -hmm. homeschoolers and more traditionally educated kids the ability to just like free play engage Mm -hmm. with reality it's it it, it's not universal but it can be quite stark the difference between the two and that desire to be childlike i talk to a lot of adults who have to relearn that they have to rediscover how to be have that childlike sense of wonder again. And a lot of the very creative adults that I know that were publicly educated that have maintained that spirit, they're just kind of outliers where the spirit was so strong that the system couldn't quash it. But I think most more people than we realize have the potential to be like that, but the system's just crushing it down. And I think everything that you said about that is incredibly important because that's such a fundamental piece of what it means to be a healthy human is to have that curiosity, that joy, that sense of play. I also think you talked, you mentioned the the children growing up in countries and in villages in those countries where they don't have access to normal school and it's very sad that they can't learn reading and writing. And I think there's a really important distinction here that needs to be made and is going to be a very radical statement but you host the radical health radio i run Mm -hmm. rebel educator we're allowed to say very bold things Mm -hmm. here uh i think even that premise deserves questioning and i don't mean that because i think kids shouldn't learn to read and write i think that they should i think it's important i think it's it opens up a lot of possibilities but i think it's kind of treated as a sort of indivisible truth Mm -hmm. it's like we we believe this is inherent you can't escape it that every child needs to learn to read and write and do math and whatever and i think that conclusion is correct but i think it stems from a deeper and more fundamental truth i don't think that's the fundamental truth i think the fundamental truth is that you want children to be able to interface with reality in as many ways as possible so that they can follow the threads of their curiosities and their passions and their desires wherever it takes Mm. them and reading and writing and math like the basic skills are the fundamental building blocks upon which many of these life trajectories are built Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so you learn those things as a code to then go integrate yourself into all of these possible paths that are unfolding. So I think the sadness is less, when you see someone who doesn't have access to that, it's less, oh, they can't read. Like that's that's a symptom of a problem. It's not the actual problem. The problem is that they don't have the surface area upon which to interface with all that the world has to offer. But I think that's an important distinction to make because the same also holds true for your inability to interface with all of these other aspects of reality that maybe get swept under the rug that you and I have been talking about Mm. around how to be healthy, Mm. uh, how to navigate interpersonal relationships and and your own spirituality and sense of sense of being well, how to interface with the natural world and understand like that too is part of the, there are many paths, possible life paths that unfold that also require literacy in those aspects of reality that we don't pay attention to. Mm -hmm. And so this deeper fundamental, well, you know, what, what is the purpose of learning those things? I think the necessity to learn to read and write comes from the exact same place as the importance to learn about the different trees and the ecosystem in the world that you're growing up with. I would argue, I think both are important grounding foundational knowledge sets to go forth into the world and find a path Mm -hmm. yeah it's super circumstantial right like you could take the smartest phd level like just 
IQ through the roof, PhD. And if you drop them with all of that knowledge into the jungle of the Amazon, it is completely worthless. And they could meet a somebody that is dumb from a Western standpoint because they can't read or write, they've never taken a test, who in that setting is incredibly intelligent and this PhD is now worthless, you know, because it's 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 adapting to that environment that you live. And I think that you, you hit the nail on the head with that, that this is like kind of codes. It's, you know, from like a, a diet standpoint, we think about, I think about at least like stacking the big the big rocks first and really building the foundational stuff and then getting worried about, you know, the little rocks, you know, but you want to get the basics done right. And in our world, in this westernized developed country, those are some pretty big rocks that you want to stack. But to think that it is, again, a capital T truth that that, you know, is so sad in another country where they won't use that skill because they're living a completely different technology, if you will. I'm always fascinated by the the bright minds here that live in the laboratories and stuff and they go to the Amazon and they want to ask the ayahuasqueros, how, how, how did you know to mix 50 some plants together to create the psychedelic brew ayahuasca? And the shamans laugh and they say, the trees told us. And it breaks the minds of these MIT science people because they're like, Tree, trees don't talk and they're like no you you have amazon the delivery service uh, you have netflix and we have the netflix of the jungle we have channels from all of these things and we can communicate with them and we can listen to them and you can't because you didn't grow up in that you know so which one is better <laughs> you know for their circumstances that one's better and i think that's a really important thing to hold uh, especially as well you know as again we we kind of wrestle with this what does the world look like when my son is 18 years old, what does the world even look like? You know, it's so hard. And I still, yeah, heck yeah, I want to teach him to do math and, and learn to read and to write and to storytell. I think particularly writing because it really helps you orient your thinking, right? And there's something very powerful about that. But you could even argue that as we're teaching that, we're getting less good at it anyway because we're outsourcing all of it to tech anyway you know so we can teach math but then nobody actually does math they just go to the phone to split the bill you know so we can teach it but then do we actually use it we've got this kind of digital dementia going on because we don't use our brains anymore we outsource everything to tech writing is just all going to become these ai tools you know oh i used to write a, a blog and now i just plug it into chat gpt and it writes it for me so it's just going to be it's like just super interesting and i think you know to refocus on on like this play versus seriousness conversation that we were having i think that's a symptom of like a root a, 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 like a root illness in our culture of what we value and i think we've taught people that we value or your worth is your productivity essentially like your worth is how productive and efficient and busy that you can be and that in our value system as a culture we've completely devalued play because it doesn't get you anything there's nothing actually that being a playful human gets you in this model of culture. That's just a waste of time. Well, you're going to go play for two hours on a Sunday when you could be writing emails and marketing and going to a business dinner and connecting and closing deals. So that's like, that's what we value. And what you value is, is what will drive you. And I think we need to assess our values. I think we really need to look at that and ask, is, is that what we want to value? Do we want to have to wear stress as a badge of honor? Do we want people working 90 hour work weeks and being on antidepressant medications and sick, but being like, oh, yay, you know, you increase growth by 10% this month. Or do we want to start valuing people that have more curiosity and playfulness, even if it doesn't get them anything tangible, but it allows them a sense of freedom and intuitive knowing and curiosity and joy? Because I think when you see those people and you interact with them, you're naturally drawn to them. You know, like there's something about them, this kind of like, I don't give a fuck about much apart from the things that deserve to be gave a fuck about <laughs> and they get like you know less wrapped up in all of that stuff you know and i think it's because it reminds us that like that's what we want too you know we i think we just get wrapped up in the somebody training ramdas called it you know from the moment you're born and you're raised in a culture you're you're somebody training you're figuring out who your somebodyness is in comparison to another's which is why in the modern world one of the first things we do is hey who are you you know what's your name what do you do for work you know what i'm doing is i'm testing my somebodyness against yours oh you're a barista i'm a doctor 
oh, I'm a doctor and you're a lawyer. Oh, which one's more of a somebody here now? You know, and it's this like social, weird social hierarchy game of nobody's like, hey, who are you? Oh, it's so nice to meet you. What What do you like to do? You know, who are you? What What makes you curious? What gets you going? You know, it's always like this weird, yeah, somebodyness in this, you know, personality game that we're playing. And persona comes from mask. So these personalities are just, we keep putting on these masks of trying to fit in, trying to be seen, trying to be loved, trying to probably heal some of that stuff that we talked about from childhood that never got healed. But it's, Gabo Mate said, you can never get enough of something that almost works. And I think that's what our culture's suffering from. Like it almost works. It like kind of scratches the itch, but it doesn't make the itch go away because like this acquisition of stuff, whether it's like, I got a promotion and you're elated for a day or a week and it almost works because this is the thing it's going to fix me. My life is going to, ah, shit. It's all the same. The same stuff is the, the same stuff. Like it didn't fix it. So, but we keep going back to the well for more because like it, it was so close. So maybe it's just a little bit more of that thing. A little bit, a little bit more, a little bit more. And you can never get enough of something that almost works. I've never heard that quote before, but I love it. That's mm -hmm. very, it's very true. And it's, it's not a, like when I talk about these things, I'm not necessarily advocating for like, just like go burn it all down. Like mm -hmm. go, go like, just like leave all of it behind everything you've built. Just like get out. It's not working for you. If that's what you're feeling like you need to do, then do it. Mm -hmm. But a lot of these social games that we're playing and stuff like there's a utility to it. There's a reason why, but you have to stop and ask questions about the why. Mm -hmm. And then which you have to make sure that you're playing, that you're consenting to play mm -hmm. each piece of this that, and you're doing it for reasons that are, you have to be unwinding the things that you've just accidentally picked up and make sure that the thing, the games that you're playing, you're playing for sincere reasons for the right reasons. How, you work with a lot of people as a coach and you dig into the stories of how people got to where they are and and help them unwind the things in their worlds that are not serving them in their journeys towards wherever it is they're trying to go. How much do you see like threads or trends stemming from childhood and the way people were raised, especially educationally, but more broadly too, if there's a different direction you want to take this, um, that are setting people up for downstream effects that maybe were not obvious mm -hmm. uh, symptoms or side effects. You know, I think a lot of how we educate kids sets up a lot of downstream effects that we don't expect to be related at all, especially in, in the space of health and wellness and happiness and life outcomes. And I'm really curious what you've noticed in working with people, if there are obvious trends or threads there very much uh it's it's pretty much the the crux of what self-development and growth is all about you know I, I obviously i coach adults and i often say that i'm really coaching the the child inside of them you know the all the stuff that they didn't get soothed healed um perspective on guidance on we're all just still at the core of who we are, like little children running around in these adult meat suits. And we, you know, we do adult things. We drive adult cars, we pay adult bills. We, we seem very, very serious. And, um, you know, archetypically we might be stuck very much though in the energy of a child, you know, like an adult is someone that is integrated and transcended a lot of the stuff from the past. And they've learned from those hardships. And a lot of the times breakdowns can lead to breakthroughs if they have the right kind of guidance and support and systems. And one thing I've learned from talking to a lot of people, the people that have been able to rebuild after the breakdown is they're always very grateful for it. And, it, and there's some harrowing stories, you know, from severe loss and abuse and all kinds of stuff that you would never want a person to go through. But there's always in the case that someone has been able to come out the other side, a, a strange kind of gratitude for it because it's it helped them to like the archetype of the Phoenix, it first has to burn before it rises from the ashes. Now, some people's trauma is so big that they just burn and it buries them and they never quite rise. And there is a lot of micro wounding like that too, where even though somebody has something happen, they just carry on with life and they're very normal on the outside, 35 year old doing life, doing what everybody's supposed to do. They'll have certain behaviors and certain tendencies and certain self-sabotaging patterns or certain belief systems about the world. There are 100% to do with the eight-year-old them that got bullied in school. 
that they never ever worked through. They just survived it. That's it. They survived it, and now it's showing up in a weird way. And when you help people retell their story, restore comes from restoring. If we don't tell the story, we destroy or destroy. So we have to help people restory and restory in a more hopeful way that is not giving the past power to define the future, but is taking the lessons and putting salve on the wound of the past so that we can move forward finally. Because a lot of people's past, they're like pasteurizing themselves. They're they're killing their future because of stuff that happened a long, long time ago, or the beliefs that they operated or, or operate from now because of what happened a long time ago. And I believe that everything that happens to us, you know, we we survive it. We get through it by virtue of being alive. Listening to this podcast, you survived every challenge that was thrown your way. But in those moments, you only had the tools that you had at that time. We we suffer a a case of presentism now, where we judge past events from our current understanding and knowledge and perspective. But at that time, when you got your heart broken when you were thirteen years old, you didn't know what you know now. So you just did what you could do then the best you could with the tools that you had. And because it survived, you get a little check mark in your internal coding system of like, all right, that's how the world works. So now maybe it's, I got my heart broken so bad and it was so painful that the thing that I'm going to do is forever wear a plate of armor over my heart and I'm never going to let that happen again, ever. So now I'll get into future relationships again. And when I feel that I'm really falling for someone, maybe I sabotage it because I don't want to feel that again. So I'm not going to have them do that to me because I remember when Dave did it to me when I was 13 years old. So I'm going to sabotage and I don't know why I did that. He was so good or whatever it is, you know, these like strange things. It's always that stuff from the past. You know, it's always with us. And, you know, Rumi said the wound is where the light enters. And I think it's important to go back. Um, not not always to like relive trauma, re-traumatize, etc., but to make sure that we're not doing the whole Lord Voldemort thing where we can't even say its name and we can't even imagine it because it's such a big scary beast that we actually give it more power than it deserves. We become the little child on the bed with the covers over our head being like this monster's getting bigger and bigger and more scared and more scared only to get off the bed and look under the bed and realize there's no monster there. You know, it's a fiction of your imagination, a seed that was planted that grew because where your attention goes is where your energy flows and that a lot of what we deal with in adults from the more basic stuff like why are you eating like a child <laughs> why are you like come on like stop stuffing five twinkies into your face like it's an emotional wound it's something from back there somewhere and there's some belief somewhere there's some statement of you know not enoughness or there's a story that you're telling that is slipping through your internal bullshit checker and you're allowing it to be manifest in your life is true and if there's one thing I've learned about humans, which is unfortunate, it's the same bad trip for all of us though, is we suffer a, a, a case of self-righteousness where we like to be right, even if it hurts ourselves. So if we have a fundamental belief that I'm not lovable, that's a, a negative belief. It's a self-limiting belief, but we also like to be right, or at least the ego does. So what we do is we go looking for all of the evidence that confirms that I am not lovable, and we will discount all of the evidence that runs contrary to it because we have our confirmation bias. So now guess what? You live a life where you are right. You are not lovable because you will manifest that. You will choose relationships that prove that to you over and over and over again. And that little ant, the automatic negative thought that runs around in your mind that you decide to jump on the back of and ride around like an ant riding cowboy now becomes your reality. So words and thoughts become things. And it's very, very important to track those ants and see where they came from because you did not come into life with them. If I cut you open and went looking for the manufacturing label that you are not lovable or you are broken or you are stupid or you are too far, or da, 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 you won't find it. It's code. It originated somewhere. Where it originated is where we have to go back to retell the story, to restore it. And then we get to kind of like cut the tie with it. Okay, now it's done. Most people don't realize it's still ruling a lot of what they do today. I wish we had more time to dig into more more pieces of this. There's so much more here to talk about, but you and I both have places we need to be. If people found this conversation interesting and they want to learn more about you and your work, where would you send them next? Probably the best place is my personal Instagram account at Peak Primal Health. Um, the podcast is Radical Health Radio, but everything gets shared through Peak Primal Health. So the podcast is reshared through the. Um, if you enjoyed this podcast and 
sorry, we've opened Pandora's box and once you <laughs> kind of pop the lid off, there's sometimes no going back. So I apologize in advance, but it's good. It's good kind of work um, that you'll find everything there. And, and I, I always make a call to action on these shows of just like, if you did listen to this, please slide into those DMs and like, let me know what you thought was valuable and fun or insightful or funny because I'm always seeking feedback too. You know, like you said, I'm pretty new to this podcast game. I really enjoy having rad conversations with radical people but it's really nice to actually hear from the audience because i'm sure you've realized it can sometimes feel like you're just echoing out into the void and you're like is are people liking this like <laughs> something people <laughs> so if you watched it like it would be really cool to hear a, a cool takeaway or something like that head over to pete primal health say hello and that's about it yeah you share a lot of really great stuff there people definitely should check it out and I definitely can't tell that you're new to the podcast thing. You're definitely, we're made for this. So thank you so much for sharing some of that here today. This was great. Yeah, thanks for having me on. The questions were awesome. And I'm sure we'll do it again in the future. Yes, please, for sure. Cool. Awesome. <laughs> You've been listening to the Hannah Franklin podcast. Thank you so much for being here. If you are listening on Apple or Spotify, please leave a rating. Please subscribe. If you're watching on YouTube, please like, subscribe, leave a comment. Let me know what you think. That's it for this week. I'll see you next week, friends.